We spoke briefly about the uh, materials which nature uh, uses to start her organic synthesis, which she uses as building blocks. And those are carbon dioxide, CO2, uh, water, uh, and phosphate, and ammonia. Uh, all of the natural molecules, one way or another, come from those materials. And as for us, we are using hydrocarbons primarily and make them unsaturated and manipulate them in different ways to get to, uh, if not similar, then the molecules which we can use to affect natural processes which are happening in natural systems. So how does nature achieve her diversity and how does she achieve her function? Her function is usually derived from biopolymers. It's those proteins, very large molecules which are assembled from amino acids, nucleic acids which are assembled from bases and carbohydrates, polycarbohydrates themselves, of course, and also it's uh, not that not different lipids. But in reality, when we look at the, for example, nucleic acids, all it takes is about five different, not about, it's only five different bases, and five carbohydrates, or two carbohydrates, two sugars, uh, not to uh, synthesize nucleic acids, uh, not the oxy, uh, ribonucleic acid DNA and ribonucleic acid RNA. 20 amino acids are put in a multitude of different ways to prepare a very different, completely unexpected structural and functional materials, which are proteins, uh, which can be biologically active enzymes, which convert compound A to compound B, which are responsible for the energy transfer, which are responsible for the tissue remodeling, in effect, for all of the functioning of a living organism. And it's only those 20 amino acids which are put together, but in a different combination, in different numbers, in different ways, What's similar here, however, that the bonds which are made, the chemical bonds which are made, are always between carbon and heteroatom and heteroatom and heteroatom. No carbon-carbon bonds are made under those conditions because energetically, again, it's cheaper, it's easier. And she also uses carbohydrates, like I mentioned. There are only about eight D different hexoses and uh, about uh, six pentoses which are used to assemble all the variety of the materials uh, or, or the variety of uh, all the molecules for both recognition, molecular recognition, and energy storage, energy transfer as well. Uh, as you can see, it's not too many building blocks. It's only about 40 building blocks, but nature exquisitely puts them together in beautiful ways to obtain all the functional diversity, to obtain all of the, uh, no, but, well, to obtain what in the end is called life information storage, information transfer, and amplification by relatively simple chemical reactions, but they are controlled in a very defined fashion, in a very defined way. We don't really have those abilities, right? We don't really have a way of preparing those complex molecules in a way nature does, simply because we don't have those enzymes, and all the chemistry that we do most of the time is not compatible with it. So a simple conclusion from this, if you want to study a system, if one wants to study a system, for example, a natural uh, system, a living cell, a living organism, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to do it with the same tools that nature is using. There is almost a socio-anthropological uh, socio aspect to it. How can you be a part of the system? How can you observe a system and yet at the same time not affect its functioning? It's, uh, and it's not a trivial question because all the chemistry that we've learned and we've developed was mimicking nature. So what chemical tools can we use to actually interrogate complex biological systems, the whole organism? And uh, one of the things uh, no, which uh, always intrigued me and for a long time is uh, how can we actually become molecules or can we behave as molecules ourselves and get a peek into the whole organism? And there are many tools which are available now, but one of the early sci-fi movies, The Fantastic Voyage from 1956, talks about the well, uh, four, uh, three men and the woman who were reduced to the size, almost molecular size or cellular size, were put into some submarine which was injected into the uh, organism of a person and they needed to travel through the blood vessels, they needed to travel through many different uh, tissues in order to get to a, uh, a blood clot which was located in that person's brain. And of course the spice CIA was involved and that uh, no, no, there were some secret conspiracies. But look at the graphics, this is 50 years ago and uh, no, 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 yeah, almost 50 years ago, and uh, they are seeing with their own eyes as they are moving through the bloodstream, as they are going into the lymph system, they are uh, looking at the macrophages, erythrocytes, in this case leukocytes, uh, they are seeing how things are happening. Can we take it from the realm of the sci-fi movies, can we take it from the realm of the fiction 
into our lab and can we actually develop tools which allow us to see the same things with our own eyes. I doubt very much that we will be able to get, uh, or that we will get reduced at any point to the size of a molecule to see molecules with our own eyes, although we can do it to some extent. It's not going to be in the same way. But as chemists, we of course don't have spies. So what we have is chemical reporters. We have different molecules which allow us to introduce them into the living organism without being modified, without being changed. And yet at the same time, we can reveal their function. We can basically stick a magnet. It would be a red magnet, which would be absolutely invisible in a living organism because it's not found in nature. She doesn't know what to do with it, and it doesn't affect her. It doesn't affect, uh, affect her functioning in any way. So what those functional groups could be, potentially? One of the sets of the reactants which can be used for that purpose are uh, 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 acetylenes, uh, the alkynes. They're compounds of carbon-carbon framework which contain a triple bond. I mentioned to you in the beginning about the chemistry of the olefins. Acetylenes, which have a triple bond, now actually move even higher in the energy ladder. So we are now at about 34, 38 kilocalories of energy above the saturated hydrocarbon. And that allows us to get to some very unusual chemical intermediates. It plays into the fundamental chemistry here and fundamental insights into the transformations of acetylenes catalyzed by metals and uh, by different other catalysts. We can also obtain very, very stable linkages from them, such as this heterocycle called triazole with three nitrogens. Those three nitrogens, which come from an organic molecule called an azide with N, N, N connections, are completely unique to uh, uh, a synth a synthetic chemistry. Nature does not use three heteroatoms in a row, so azides and therefore triazoles are not really found in nature, uh, as uh, are not olefins. Those triazoles can be, for synthetic purposes, manipulated with other catalysts, and those catalysts can open them up, convert them to even yet more reactive species, which are transient, very short-living, but in the end would allow us to assemble carbon-carbon bond frameworks with precision and with introduction of the natural elements of chirality. So to manipulate our olefins, we obviously need to understand how the, our acetylenes, I'm sorry, to manipulate our acetylenes, we obviously need to understand from the fundamental viewpoint what best reactants, what best reactive partners for them are. And I already alluded to it, I mentioned that one of the reactive partners which came to, uh, well, uh, to use, especially in biological setting in chemistry uh, of, of the living systems of biomolecules is organic azide. So very briefly, acetylenes, shown in red, are the ones which are, uh, have been known for a very long time, since 1838. They were discovered as byproducts of uh, 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 gas and oil uh, uh, industry at that time. And uh, also, uh, uh, they have been, well, acetylene gas itself has been used as a lighting gas uh, in uh, lanterns in, uh, 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 for a long time. Azides, on the other hand, did not find any commercial uses for a long time, although have been known also since 1864. They were discovered by Peter Greece. Uh, they are not found in nature. Like I mentioned, those three nitrogens are never connected to nature in any way. They are very, very stable, despite the uh, preconceived notions and uh, misconceptions about them. Those usually are reasonably stable compounds. They don't get hydrolyzed. They don't react with natural amino acids, electrophiles, nucleophiles, especially which are present in, uh, in living systems. And in 2000, uh, in the year 2000, Carolyn Bertozzi, who was working at the time at the University of California in Berkeley, used organic azides as reporters to introduce them in living organisms and to prepare carbohydrates for the first time containing the azides and for tracking them. Azides and acetylenes, not being natural materials, they are still found uh, the reactivity of them, between them two, has been known for some time. So they can actually react together to form those five-membered, very stable heterocycles. And that has been discovered by Arthur Michael uh, of Michael Additions uh, in, uh, already in 1893. Then in uh, 1950s, in 1960s, the theory of dipolar cycloadditions was studied very thoroughly by Rolf Huizgen in Germany. But again, there are not too many applications, with, in fact, none, no, no applications of organic azide acetylene coupling cycloaddition uh, not until about uh, 10, 11 years ago. Uh, and uh, they uh, 
not to give you an idea about this chemistry, about this reaction, in order for this reaction to occur, in order for these compounds to be formed, even when you use very, very activated acetylenes, such as this acetylene shown on the bottom, the acetylene dicarboxylic acid, very electron deficient acetylene, you still need to use very strenuous conditions. You need to heat it for not, not for a long time at 90 degrees or so. And of course, the rates of the reaction are very, very low. So in that setting, it doesn't really offer itself, doesn't lend itself to become a tool for investigation of biological transformations. On the other hand, if we look at the acetylides, metal acetylides, so those are the derivatives again of acetylenes which have been known for a long time, and we use copper as a metal which we prepare our derivative from. It's an, a complex of an acetylene gas, um, or acetylene, I'm sorry, not acetylene gas, of uh, triple bonded hydrocarbons called acetylenes with copper one, primarily copper one ions, uh, those form very well-known stable and unreactive complexes. They are usually yellow, they are usually uh, very, or sometimes very dark yellow, dark brown in color, stable. They can be formed under aqueous conditions as well, but they don't participate in any of the reactions. They don't work in any of the chemistries. The reason is they are very highly aggregated. They are polymeric materials like I've shown here. So they don't even dissolve in any solvents, let alone react. Uh, if we, however, think about it, uh, about the formation of the acetylene or copper acetylides as an in situ process, a, a process which you can do before they, and uh, you can catch those acetylides before they form polymers, you may be able to find that, no, or no, 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 may be able to oh, no, no, tune up their window of reactivity, find their window of reactivity with different other electrophiles. And that was the discovery which uh, no, I made in, 19, uh, in uh, 2001, uh, no, I'm sorry, in 2001, when the reaction of copper uh, sulfate, not, not normal, very well-known stable copper sulfate, salt, copper two salt, with acetylenes in the presence of ascorbic acid, vitamin C, was done in water. So you can see, even in this case, comparing to those slides which I showed before, the material which you form stays, although it's opaque, it doesn't, if that, that stay clear in solution, it does persist for a long time. It does persist for at least 15 minutes, and that's a long, long time on the time scale of chemistry, on the time, on the time scale of chemical reactions. And the reason that it works so well, that before aggregating in order for, to form those polymeric unreactive materials, copper needs to exchange its ligands. But by the very same token, it exchanges its ligands at a very, at a very high rate. That's a property of late uh, transition metals of the, especially first row transition metals, that their aqua ligands are exchanged pretty much at the rate of the diffusion, 10 to the 9th over second. And therefore, those catalysts, uh, not, not, and therefore those catalysts and those materials which are formed under aqueous conditions, they become not very well defined materials, not very well defined catalysts. And chemists in general, we like defined things because we know how they look, we know how they function, or we believe we know. In reality, it's not all that simple. But if we know the structure, we should be able to predict the function or control reactivity. Another approach, another way of looking at it, that sometime it's worth not getting that extra bit of control and letting the system choose its own best state to adapt. Because that's a direct analogy, direct analogy to evolution. It's a, on a very, very primitive scale, of course, in chemistry. But it is an evolutionary process where a catalyst finds its own most adaptable, most adaptable and preferred state for a particular transformation. Those examples are very rare, but they do happen. And the copper catalyzed cycloaddition was one of those such examples. Uh, it works very well in aqueous systems. All it takes is a little bit of ascorbic acid, and it actually has been used in the last 10, 15, no, no, 12 years very, very uh, uh, widely by chemists, biologists, polymer chemists, material scientists, and so forth. 